President Joe Biden continues to issue executive orders to reverse Trump's horrific legacy. But even with Trump gone, we must confront the ways that his popularity exposes a deeper corrosive force at the heart of our country. This is our tendency toward domination. If we wanna root out the ideas of white supremacy that led to the fatal attempted coup in early January of this year, we need to understand how our culture contributes to that problem. Rianne Eisler is here with me to talk now about male violence and the possibility of societal collapse. Rianne is the president of the Center for Partnership Studies and the editor-in-chief of the Interdisciplinary Journal of Partnership Studies. She is the author of numerous books, including this book, The Chalice and the Blade, that has, it, it changed my life back when I read it, and it has made all of the cuts I've made to my personal library over the years. So stuck with me. Uh, other books include The Real Wealth of Nations. And she has a recent book that just came out that I encourage everyone to go and read called Nurturing Our Humanity, How Domination and Partnership Shape Our Brains, Lives, and Future. Rianne, thank you so much for joining me here today. It, it's a pleasure to be with you, Juliana. From this book, the Chalice and the Blade, a quote is, human evolution is now at a crossroads. Stripped to its essentials, the central human task is how to organize society to promote the survival of our species and the development of our unique potentials. In the past four years, we've seen an uptick in violence from white men. How can we understand events like the January 6th siege on Capitol Hill from the lens of our changing social systems? Well, as you know, I've been studying the social dynamics, uh, not only of our present, but of our past and our potential future for several decades. And if you place this uh, in terms of the lens provided by my work, which is the partnership domination social scale, you can see that really what's happening is that the uh, struggle for our future is not between right and left and religious and secular and Eastern and Western. There have been repressive regimes in every one of these categories, but really within all of these systems between the configurations, two underlying configurations, the partnership system and the domination system. And this is what we're seeing, uh, whether it's the Black Lives uh, Matter movement, whether it is the uh, movements for social and economic justice, uh, whether it was the uh, movement uh, uh, in, in terms of uh, having uh, women have more rights, the movement against violence, uh, which is pandemic against women and children, they're all really exactly, <laughs> they're the, the the partnership system resurging and the domination system resisting. Now, in periods like ours of rapid, rapid technological change of dislocation, uh, the domination resistance really to change becomes much stronger and the pull back and we're in the midst of a regression really. At the same time, there's very strong movement towards partnership. Uh, so if we look at it that way, we can see, for example, that what you have in the so-called uh, incel men, you know, involuntarily celibate men, uh, mostly white men, uh, is this sense, sense of entitlement that, of course, we're, we're entitled to dominate, in this case, dominate women primarily. Uh, and have access to women's bodies. But it goes much deeper because what we're really dealing with uh, is in-group versus out-group thinking. Mm -hmm. And it isn't a question of women against men or men against women. I wanna say that up front. It is something that we've all to certain degrees internalized and that thankfully many, many more of us are becoming aware of. Rianne, many people talk about the domination structure in terms of a patriarchy. Could you talk about your thoughts about that? 
I don't use these terms, and I think our language traps us. It's not only right, left, religious, secular, Eastern, Western, which if you think about it, actually ignore or at best marginalize the majority of humanity, women and children. So they fragment our consciousness. Don't let us see the whole picture. If you look at matriarchy and patriarchy, they are two sides of a domination coin. You know, either father's rule or mother's rule. There is no partnership alternative. It, and of course there is. Uh, we see that it works better, mutuality, people are happier. Uh, people thrive, children develop. Uh, it is, and nature is cared for. Mm. Uh, so, uh, that's it's nice our when job nature now. even enters into conversations these days. Well, I think that uh, it's all part of the picture, isn't it? And we are so used to think in these siloed ways. As I said, our conventional categories and even the conventional uh, progressive social movements are so siloed. Whereas in fact, they're all part of the partnership movement. The, look, if you look at modern history, from this perspective, what you see is that all the progressive social movements have challenged the same thing. They have challenged a tradition of domination. Going back to the enlightenment, the so-called rights of man movement, rights challenging the supposedly divinely ordained right of kings to rule, or the feminist movement challenging the so-called divinely ordained right of men to rule over women and children, uh, the abolitionist, the civil rights, the black, rights movement, the anti-colonial movements, again, challenging another tradition of domination, the so-called divinely ordained right of a, quote, superior race to rule over an inferior one, all the way to the environmental movement, challenging our once hallowed conquest and domination of nature. Do you and think if we, oh, if we have that frame, we are much more empowered and effective. Do you think that, that the, the impetus toward domination is a psychological impetus that's innate to human beings? Or do you think it's conditioned from being brought up with this, um, you know, this fight between the partnership and domination models? Absolutely the latter. You know, uh, my latest book, which you mentioned, Nurturing Our Humanity, draws heavily from both social and biological science, especially neuroscience. And what we are learning is that we have been told false stories, inaccurate stories about, quote, human nature. Mm. If anything, our brains, by the grace of evolution, are more primed. Look, we get, <laughs> the experiments have shown that the pleasure centers in our brains uh, are much more activated when we share and care than when we win or dominate. I mean, it's that simple. However, what you said is the key. We also know from neuroscience that our brains develop an in, in interaction with our environments, which are mostly cultural for us as humans. And the early years where children experience and observe are fundamental. And this is one of the problems that if children grow up, I mean, why do you think that those pushing us back, whether it was Hitler in Germany, Khomeini in Iran, the Taliban, the rightist fundamentalist alliance, Stalin in the former Soviet Union, always either may, want to maintain or reimpose a quote, traditional family, which is a code for an authoritarian, rigidly male dominated, highly punitive family, because that is again, one of the cornerstones. Yeah. Uh, and it has a huge impact uh, on how we feel, we think, how we act, how we vote. And in periods of massive dislocation, like this rapid shift from the industrial to the post-industrial knowledge service era, we're seeing it writ large. 
uh, people feel more comfortable if they're brought up in these kinds of environments with, quote, strong man leaders, or at least leaders who claim that they're strong men, <laughs> uh, which takes us right to where we are today. And thank goodness we, thank you. Oh, we, sorry, sorry. <laughs> well, he said it. He said it's all about domination. Remember? Yes. And for him and for people brought up in these environments, really, there are only two alternatives. You either dominate or you're dominated. There is no partnership alternative. And we've got to show as progressives, not only to deconstruct, I mean, which we've been doing and doing and doing, but to what are the ways that we can reconstruct and build what we so need and want. And as you know from the chalice and the blade, uh, all of our progressive movements have very ancient roots because for most of our prehistory, millennia, the cultural direction was more in a partnership rather than domination direction. And that's important for us to know, just as it's important to know the true story of human nature. And yes, to have a, Einstein said it, he said, you cannot solve problems with the same thinking that created them. And language is so important. I mean, like I make a distinction between two kinds of hierarchies because there are hierarchies in partnership systems, but they're not domination hierarchies where uh, accountability, uh, benefit, uh, respect only flows from the bottom up. They are what I call hierarchies of actualization, right? Where power is empowering rather than disempowering. And we read about this in nothing less than the management literature. There's so many seemingly disconnected trends towards partnership. Our job, and it is so empowering, as you know, uh, when we see that we're part of this historic, uh, enormously important partnership movement. And put all of these movements together and also focus on what I have identified as four cornerstones, which have been marginalized, unfortunately, in the progressive, not in the regressive agenda, but in the progressive Talk agenda. Talk about those, please. That would be very helpful. Very happy to. First, we've already talked about childhood, right? And what we know from neuroscience. I mean, let's not kid ourselves. Uh, our very brains uh, are formed, the structure of our brains in those early years in interaction with our cultural environments as mediated uh, largely through families, but also through education, religion, uh, economics, very important, and I'll get to that, politics. So childhood, one, gender. You may not think that because most progressives are somewhat better educated, and what have we been educated in? To marginalize. I mean, think about it. David Noble, the historian of science, wrote a book called A World Without Women. Modern science, modern so-called humanities, came out of a misogynist, celibate, all-male culture about six, seven hundred years ago. And we only had women's studies and men's studies and gender studies and queer studies until about 50 years ago, for goodness sakes. Mm. So conditioned have we been to not understand that when children are socialized in domination systems, there are very rigid gender stereotypes. And if you don't fit into them, you are in trouble. Both as a man, you know, you're a sissy, you're a wimp, right? Or as a woman. You know, you're a ball breaker, you're not feminine, Someone right? Just told me that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, I'm like, well, yes. good then. <laughs> good then. Well, this is, you couldn't have said that out loud anyway, several hundred years ago. Okay, so we have been reconnecting uh, because of the, largely because of the disequilibrium of the acceleration of the move from the agrarian to the industrial age. You know, I mean, this equilibrium sort of has 
crisis, but opportunity, doesn't it? Just as the pandemic, by the way, today mm -hmm. is both a crisis and an opportunity for us to think deeply. But, but, but there is something I want to get to, and I will with the fourth cornerstone, economics. Mm -hmm. Our economic systems, like our thinking and our institutions, have a, a hidden system of gendered values mm -hmm. in which anything stereotypically now in domination systems, considered feminine, like caring, caregiving, nonviolence, is considered inferior to anything stereotypically. I love that the new economy is a caring economy. Yes, mm -hmm. caring. I mean, when I wrote my book, The Real Wealth of Nations, I deliberately made the subtitle, Creating a Caring Economy. Mm -hmm. That was in 2007. It's, it's recently been updated, by the way, and there is now a condensed and updated German edition. But at that time, caring economy, nobody, I mean, people said, what? Why do you put caring and economy together? Today, that term is gaining currency. It's been somewhat co-opted to only mean the care economy rather than an economy informed by caring for people caring for nature. And by the way, we at the Center for Partnership Studies have developed new metrics, which is a whole sub subject in itself, because GDP reflects and perpetuates the gendered system of values. Mm -hmm. uh, and I can maybe go into that if we have time. But well, we're I, here, we're here, so you better we're say, here, it. say it. <laughs> okay, I we will say it. it. <laughs> look, if you really look at GDP, I mean, it's a mess. It uh, actually includes activities that harm and take life. Uh, cigarettes, the fast foods, you know, the resulting medical costs, of the funeral costs, they're all great for GDP. Uh, a, a stand of trees, a forest, it only shows up in GDP when it's dead, when it's chopped down. So GDP really incentivizes, okay, harming people and nature, but it reflects an underlying system of values. So we've developed new metrics that are very different, not only from GDP, but from most GDP alternatives, because it shows the economic value, not only the environmental and the human value of caring for people starting at birth and caring for nature, which is essential in our post-industrial knowledge service era. So, Rian, let's talk about the fourth cornerstone. Well, that is stories, narratives, and language. As I said, we've been told false stories, and it's up to us as progressives to know the true story of not only our present, but our past and the possibilities for our future. And also language. You know, linguistic psychologists have long told us that the languages, you know, the words, the terms provided by our culture channel our thinking. So as I said, I've introduced new language, uh, the partnership and domination configurations, the hierarchies of actualization versus hierarchies of domination. We need new language if we are going to create new realities. And uh, I, I think that we, our humans are so creative. I believe that once we, as progressives, as human beings, this is really, uh, you know, we all want the same thing, caring connection. Humans, whether they're so-called conservatives or liberals or whatever, a socialist or capitalist, um, um, we have to create the environment. That Leanne, could we have them. capitalism and a caring environment at the same time? Yes, because capitalism is simply markets. I mean, never mind this nonsense about pure selfishness being what runs things. I mean, if you if you tell that to a child, you know, I mean, you, you, you'd consider it laughable to say that selfishness is great, right? <laughs> and that's what we're told economically, which is nuts. But, and, and, and as a matter of fact, Smith did not really mean that. 
and he also had a role for government regulation. Look, the pandemic has shown us that we need both markets and government policies, but both need to be caring for people starting at birth and for our natural life support systems, period. So, I still, um, you know, I can't get in, into my head how we could have the kind of capitalism that we have now, which, as you said, doesn't doesn't uh, value the tree stand. How what are the what are the values um, uh, that underlie the caring economy? How would we when we just getting back to the GDP conversation, how would we measure uh, the success of our economy? Very simply. Uh, we would show the return on investment uh, in caring for people starting at birth and caring for our natural environment. And that's what the social wealth economic indicators, which we are now a team of economists with us, is uh, updating and condensing them into an easy to access index, you know, instead of 24 indicators, one or two indicators, okay? That's that is, is a we tool. We need it in talking points so Americans can understand. <laughs> Absolutely. We need tools. And this is one thing I want to invite people to become part of making partnerism mainstream, to support and uh, disseminate the concept of the sort of wealth economic indicators, the social wealth index, uh, and to really see the connections, as I said, uh, between, uh, yeah, well, money. Uh, that's another <laughs> thing. How we issue money is, is a little bit crazy, you know, but uh, that's another program, I think. Yes, um, and we're, I, I'm glad you said off air that you were willing to come back because I feel like we have an enormous amount uh, to discuss. And I want to make sure that the viewers uh, that, that they get your perspective on what happened on January 6th. You, again, in the Chalice and the Blade, you said human evolution is now at a crossroads, meaning we have a choice in which direction we would like to go. Um, it seems that those folks they, they, who stormed the, the Capitol are, you know, they're, they're having a hard time changing with the changes that are happening to the economy, which I, are within in the world, which I would imagine are moving closer to the caring economy. It's like they fight back. They don't want to do any caring and they think they're caring, no. but they're not. Because it's caring is devalued as quote feminine and it's devalued really also by women. So that somehow there's always enough money for uh, prisons, right? You know, the, the stereotype of the punitive male head of households or for weapons and wars, you know, the stereotype of domination, stereotype of the hero as killer. But somehow we don't have enough money for caring for people, for health care, for child care, for child nutrition. I mean, it's a crazy, crazy, crazy system. And that's why we have to unpack this gender system of values and stop dismissing gender as, yeah, it's nice, but we'll get to it when we have dealt with, of quote, more important issues. It is important. It How is can we one of the four core. I have a feeling they're not watching this interview. Uh, <laughs> Do you have any ideas? I, <laughs> I think the one thing that we have to understand about the dominator or authoritarian personality, it follows authority figures. So with uh, President Biden in power now, uh, with some of the Republicans, um, it, it, you know, I mean, it, it, it's, it's really bizarre uh, how they are frightened of Trump. They're scared. I mean, he dominates them. It's a fascinating phenomenon. But we have an opportunity. If enough of us speak up, we can change the norms. And the pandemic, you know, we hear about returning to the old normal. We don't want to return to an old normal where in this was the United States, one fifth of all children lived in poverty. I mean, that's crazy. We want to create a new and better normal. But for this, we need new thinking, 
new conceptual framework, new tools. And uh, if you look at what happened, uh, you know, at the Capitol, uh, what you see is the domination system uh, creating false narratives. This is nothing new. I mean, these people will obey and listen to their authority figures. Religion has a role to play in this. I mean, we dismiss religion, many progressives, but let me tell you, the majority of the world's people identify still with a religion. We've got to get progressive voices in religious communities, in spiritual communities. Uh, cannot ignore that. Uh, we have to speak uh, the domination has been projected on I, I God, think, and then they just think, oh, well. Oh, yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah. God-fearing, uh, God will punish you. Who the heck is that? You know, it's a reflection of proto-domination systems. Rianne, I, I have mean, enjoyed this conversation. That. I have enjoyed this conversation tremendously. Uh, Rianne Eisler is the president of the Center for Partnership Studies and the editor-in-chief of the Interdisciplinary Journal of Partnership Studies. Don't forget to get the books. The Chalice and the Blade is one of my favorites. There's The Real Wealth of Nations and a most recent book that just came out that I'd like to, once I've had time to deeply get in there and read the whole thing, I'd love for you to come back on the show to discuss it. The book is called Nurturing Our Humanity, How Domination and Partnership Shape Our Brains, Lives, and Future. Final words as we face this intersection uh, where we where we have a choice? Well, two very simple things. One, we have some websites that I really think I'd like people to go to uh, centerforpartnership.org and partnerism.org. Uh, also, if you get the chalice and the blade, be sure to get the 56th or 57th printing. Uh, which is, you know, the U.S. printing, if you're getting it in English, because it has a new epilogue, taking it up to date, up to Trump, actually. Oh, um, so wonderful. I think that that is important. But look, I mean, human uh, cultures are human creations. We created them. We can recreate better, more partnership-oriented cultures that are caring and sustainable and equitable. It's, it's that Rianne, simple. Thank you. thank you so much for being with us. I really appreciate it. Thank you. You're watching ACT TV. I'm Juliana Forlano. Thanks for watching. We'll be back tomorrow. Please subscribe to our channel if you like this kind of talk. And don't forget to, you know, this particular interview, you might want to spread around uh, so that we can affect the thinking that underlies uh, the policy and everything else. Thanks so much for watching.